the Giants starting pitching. It has somewhat surprisingly not been the strength of this team outside of the top three guys, Logan Webb, Alex Cobb, and Anthony DiScalfani. But other than that, it's been kind of a mess. And yet you've got some high-end guys like Kyle Harrison and others waiting at the high levels of the minors. And so in order to eventually fit these guys onto the team, are the Giants going to have to trade from their starting rotation? So we'll get to that question and many others about the farm system largely next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked on Giants, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on the show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts, including YouTube. Check us out there if you have not already, and please hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. Also, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. And coming up on today's show, we are going to be doing a mailbag episode. Thank you so much. These are older questions, but you know, thank you to those who asked these questions. I hope that uh, you're able to listen if you were the one asking the question, and obviously everybody else as well. So jumping right in, the first question, it's actually a, uh, uh, a couple of questions here. The Tim Reaper says, if and when Kyle Harrison is called up, do you think the Giants trade a starting pitcher if he solidifies? They have quite a few long relief arms. And what do you think they would want for one of Stripling, Manaya, Junis, or how do you see that playing out? And then relatedly, uh, basically, there are other, qu- I, I guess I lost it, but there was another question essentially asking the same thing. And it's a great question because I don't exactly know the answer, but what I do know is that I mean, we addressed this a little bit yesterday, but as of right now, they're kind of going with a four-man rotation with Webb, obviously, and Cobb, and DiSclafani, and Wood has been in there, but Wood has struggled, and then they've been doing bullpen games in the interim with Ross Stripling on the injured list, and Sean Manaya has been in the bullpen, uh, and then you've also got another long guy in Jacob Junis in the bullpen, And previously, they had another long guy in Tristan Beck in the bullpen. So if you start adding, I mean, specifically your question is about Kyle Harrison, then it is like hard to see exactly who goes. And do you really want so many long guys in the bullpen? I think that's part of uh, the early part of the season when the bullpen was having its struggles. It was that they were using a lot of these long relievers instead of like their high end relievers and now you've got Luke Jackson back in that bullpen as well and so essentially yes I do see a scenario in which if Kyle Harrison comes up because of whatever opening like right now with Ross Stripling on the injured list there would be an opening for Kyle Harrison if he was like doing exactly what they wanted him to do which is I mean he's doing basically everything except just having consistent command and essentially He's walking too many people, but if he wasn't, we could easily see him right now. And instead of these bullpen type games, just giving Kyle Harrison an opportunity. So let's just say that situation comes up. Let's say he has a few starts in a row where he just is commanding the baseball and is proving that he's able to do it. And he gets that opportunity. And like you said, if he solidifies, could I, I guess I'm going to get back to the question. Uh, Do you think the Giants trade a starting pitcher? if he solidifies. And so I could easily see it. There was a headline, I think it was Ken Rosenthal just today saying that the there's a tremendous demand for starting pitching on the trade market and not a lot of supply. And the Giants are a team that might have a supply uh, 
you know, where there's a shortage of such a supply. And when it comes to who might you look to trade, uh, you know, let's go through the options. Well, there, you're obviously not trading Logan Webb here in this scenario. So next on the list would be, we're going to go from, you know, just the best pitchers on down. Next would be Alex Cobb. I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think they're trading Alex Cobb because right now, to me, he's their second best starting pitcher. He is on a very reasonable contract of only $9 million this year. Plus there's a $10 million club option for 2024. So the Giants can keep Cobb next year as well. And if he keeps pitching the way he's pitched, basically to me, since putting on a Giants uniform, despite some kind of fluky, poor results at times last year, then there's no doubt you want to pick that up. And so after those two, as I said, you've got Anthony DiSclafani, and he is also under contract for next year. And so I don't think you want to start messing around with guys you've already got under contract for next year. They plan on contending not only this year, but also next year. So Webb and I think Cobb and I think DiSclafani are mostly off the table when it comes to this conversation. So that's where it gets inter interesting because Alex Wood is the first guy where there's an exception. He is a free agent at the end of this season. This is his last year under contract. He's only making a very reasonable $12.5 million this season. And so could I see Alex Wood potentially being dealt if Kyle Harrison comes up and proves he deserves a spot and everybody else is healthy and there's just not room for everyone else? I could definitely see it, especially when we consider the fact that Sean Manaya and Ross Stripling are like the other two guys, I guess Jacob Junis, but he's really more of a reliever and I think valuable in the role that he provides. Although certainly you could see a trade of Jacob Junis, it would just be kind of a smaller deal. But with Stripling and Manaya, what's important to point out is that they both have this club option, excuse me, player option for next season. And so it's these are both two-year, $25 million deals. So those deals, given that the performance hasn't been good for either, Manaya's been good in his last three outings out of the bullpen, so much so that I even suggested yesterday flip-flopping Alex Wood and Sean Manaya and maybe giving Manaya some, some starts and putting Alex Wood in that bullpen role. But, uh, you know, it's going to be hard. These guys kind of probably have negative trade value at this moment in time. And so you're going to have to have them build it up. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time trading them unless you're eating some of the money or attaching a prospect, which I don't think they want to mess around with that. So to me, the guy who probably stands out is Alex Wood. But that's only like if you really feel confident that Kyle Harrison or whoever else could be Keaton Wynn or both uh, come up and establish themselves and prove that they belong. And then you're looking at Webb. Cobb, Di Sclafani, and I mean, I guess then Harrison, and maybe you put Sean Manaya and or Ross Stripling back in there, and or Jacob Junis, or and or Keaton Wynn gets that opportunity as well. So it it could definitely happen, uh, but you know, a lot. Of, uh, I th I don't think we're there yet. It's June first. Trade deadline is end of July. So there's you know we've got we've got a couple months left to kind of see how this shakes out. But it's definitely something to keep in mind so we will get more into more questions in just a minute including the rise of carson wisenhunt people are asking about carson wisenhunt and for good reason we're going to talk about this uh pick from the giants in last year's draft who is having a phenomenal start to his pro career and is climbing up the ladder quickly so we'll get into him and much more in just a minute but before we do this episode is brought to you by game time buying tickets to your favorite event shouldn't have to be so stressful and for me i know in the past before game time it almost always was and what you may not know about me is that i stress out a lot about getting the right price like i'll sit there contemplating whether or not to pull the trigger because i'm worried is it the right time you know am i buying too soon am i buying too late is it the best price i can get for the tickets i want well with game time you get the lowest price guarantee, which means you will always get the best price. If you find tickets in that same section 
and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. And this is another big thing, images of seat views. Whether or not you've been to the venue, but especially if not for me, I want to know what that what that seat looks like. Sometimes there's something unexpected that maybe is not anticipated. And so images of seat views is a big deal as well that Game Time solves. And therefore, you can snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked on MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked on MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, as promised, more questions and answers. The next one uh, coming from MJ, who says, Any idea on how fast Carson Wisenhunt will move in the system? Could he be a better prospect than Kyle Harrison? And then Anime Consumerism asks or says, Carson Wisenhunt has been great in A ball and high A ball this year. So do you see him? as a possibility in the rotation slash bullpen by opening day 2024. Obviously a long shot, but he seems really good. And so, yeah, the people want to know about Carson Wisenhunt, and for good reason. He just pitched yesterday, and I mean, I'm I'm checking on his, uh, you know, his performances each and every day. That's how impressive he has been. And so this these questions, I don't remember exactly when they were asked, but they were asked a while ago, and... So he's only continued to impress since these questions were asked. Thanks again, by the way, for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. Every dayers, tomorrow on the show, we're going to be actually getting to a fresh batch of mailbag questions. These are leftovers from, you know, I've combined like the last several weeks of mailbag questions to give you the pertinent ones today. But how about some fresh ones tomorrow and continuing to give you updates on the latest with Giants minor leaguers. So the everydayers will hear that tomorrow. By the way, the Giants play the Orioles tomorrow at 7.15 Pacific. And the Orioles, they have a great record, but looking at these pitching matchups, the Giants have the advantage. Logan Webb going and, you know, a couple pitchers in the first two games of the series who just, the Giants should be able to hit. And they've got Webb and Cobb. So it's a, it's a, you're playing a good team but it's an opportunity to win some games and important as they fell back to 500. Catch every pitch of the Giants' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app, search Giants. So Carson Wisenhunt, he was the second round pick of the Giants in the 2022 draft just last year, right after Reggie Crawford, who, you know, we're talking about fresh mailbag questions for tomorrow. Hopefully there's something about Reggie Crawford or I'll just update you on him. He was their first round pick and, you know, he was coming off Tommy John and finally he's made his professional kind of, uh, you know, affiliate debut and he just made it the other day. So we'll get into him at another time, but that's exciting. But their second round pick was Carson Wisenhunt, who I believe the story is he basically was viewed as a guy who could have been a top 15 talent in the draft, but had a PED suspension that kept him out of pitching pretty much all of his final year in college. Uh, so he kind of fell and slipped a little bit and the Giants were able to get him 66th overall. And what has he done? I mean, this season in particular, he went to low A where he just absolutely dominated across four starts, only 13 and two thirds innings in those four starts, but uh, the strikeout rate of 35%, a walk rate of 7%, ground ball rate of 53%, which is intriguing. Uh, left-handed pitcher plus plus changeup. I mean, if you haven't, you've probably seen the highlights. If you're someone who is on Twitter from time to time, you've probably seen people tweeting out highlights of Carson Wisenhunt's changeup. And so, yeah, I mean, so he was at low A. He's 22 years old. So I think, I don't know exactly what's normal for being in low A, but I think that's a little bit old for low A. And so you want to push him a little bit aggressively, at least, uh, to move him up and get him to more age-appropriate levels. I'm kind of swimming in uncharted waters. I need to learn more about what's age-appropriate for what level. But anyway, at 22 years old, obviously a college pick, not a high school pick. So then they promote him to high A. 
And so since the promotion to high A, he's made six starts compared to those four he made in low A. And what has he done? He's basically done the same or better. He's been be even better at a higher level. He's made six starts, 25 in a third inning, so getting stretched out more. The strikeout rate improved from 35.1% in low A to now 38.3% in high A. And this is just, this is a very high strikeout rate. I keep wanting to remind everyone that the major league average strikeout rate is like 23%. And so I don't know exactly what the average is in high A, but I do know that it's, I'm, I can say with a lot of confidence, it's much lower than 38%. So he is striking people out at a very high rate. And the, you know, it's around 13 strikeouts per nine innings. Some people like to hear it in those terms. Uh, and the walk rate continues to be completely manageable at eight and a half percent. Like the one part of the question here was, is he a better pitching prospect than Kyle Harrison? I wouldn't go so far as to say that at this point, but doesn't have the command issues that Kyle Harrison has had. We've seen Harrison in AAA this year, literally with a strikeout rate on the season over 20% and Wisenhunt here at 8.5%. So it's not all about strikeouts and walks, but that's a big part of it. Opponents uh, hitting against him, I I can't even find it as I scroll. Uh, 107 in high A and... Yeah, just like utter domination. And the ERA here is 1.42. Fielding independent pitching, 2.77. And so it's odd, though. The the ground ball rate has fallen significantly from 53%. I guess it was a small sample in high A or low A. And it's still a small sample. So I don't know exactly where that, if he's going to be a ground ball pitcher. But basically, he's dominated two levels already over a short span and the Giants have been rather aggressive with promotions this season. And so I think, like, I don't think I'm out of line here in suggesting that we could see this guy promoted to double A in the near term. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if he was promoted before his next start. That's how good he's been. I mean, he just started yesterday and he went five innings. He allowed one hit zero walks, zero hit by, he allowed seemingly one base runner and he struck out seven. And yeah, like I said, no walks. So just utter domination for Carson Wisenhunt and you love to see it. And like, at what point do you deserve a promotion? I mean, I, I can't see any reason. He's clearly demonstrating proficiency at this level and so he can move quickly and again they just drafted this guy less than 12 months ago they drafted him in they call it the june amateur draft but wasn't it in july isn't the draft in july now anyway so uh he's exciting and someone to watch and thank you for the question about him so coming up in just a minute questions about jimmy glowenke a name that we haven't talked about in a while but he he was kind of under the radar and like people were wondering why wasn't he playing but suddenly uh, he was playing and he was promoted and then we'll also give you the latest on Marco Luciano and Luis Matos two of the Giants higher end prospects as they continue to rise through this system so we'll get into all of that in just a minute but first all right as promised more questions and answers Jimmy Glowenke someone we haven't discussed much like I probably haven't even mentioned his name since the day he was drafted but uh, he's someone to pay attention to as is of course Marco Luciano and as is of course uh, Luis Matos who may be the most interesting of all and was perhaps a Michael Conforto IL stint away from being called up but it looks like Conforto is day-to-day -day, and so maybe we don't see that Matos promotion but we'll check in on Luis Matos nonetheless Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Every day is fresh batch of mailbag questions. We're going to have, you know, Casey Schmidt and Patrick Bailey in the major leagues. We haven't done a mailbag round since then. And so there's going to be all kinds of new stuff, hopefully some Reggie Crawford questions as well. So every day is we'll hear that tomorrow. And speaking of tomorrow, the Giants play the Orioles at 715 Pacific and Logan Webb is on the mound for the Giants. They just lost a series against the Pirates the Orioles have a very good record, but I just feel like uh, the Giants have a chance to, to at least take two out of three in this series. 
a lot of orange in this series. And so I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a good test and hopefully a good series. So you can catch every pitch of the Giants' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Giants. So Chris asks, and again, with uh, in fairness to Chris, this question was asked a, at least a week ago, possibly two, three, four weeks ago. Uh, Chris asked, why hasn't Jimmy Glowinky been playing recently? And I, I kind of skipped over it because I have no idea. A lot of times when minor league players get hurt, we don't get updates, which I think is dumb. They should totally be updating us on players who are injured in the minor leagues, uh, especially some of their better prospects or higher round draft picks. He was there. He, he went 68th overall in that 2020 draft, which included Patrick Bailey, Kyle Harrison, Casey Schmidt. And so Glowenke, he went ahead of Kyle Harrison in this draft. Giants waited on Harrison until the third round, and they had a couple supplementary picks in between the second and the third round. But Jimmy Glowinky, I don't know. I don't know why he wasn't playing. I didn't, I can't even tell you I noticed that he wasn't playing. But what I do know is that he eventually was playing and, and playing at high A, where he played last year for quite a bit. I mean, 75 games, 282 plate appearances in high A Eugene last year. And was about league average, and, and it wasn't particularly pretty. He hit 212 with a 301 on base, a 412 slugging. That's some nice power given the gap between the average and the uh, and the slugging. It's 200 points, which is the isolated power, and that's pretty rock solid. But the two, 212 average and the 301 on base are not very good. But this year, he goes back to high A, same level, and in 105 plate appearances, he improved his slash line to a 313 batting average, a 413 on base. Always great to see a 100 point differential between the average and the on base. It means you're walking a lot. And sure enough, the walk rate was 12.4%. A 542 slugging, which sounds so much higher than 412 from last year, but a lot of that is the increase in batting average. So the isolated power only rose from 200 to 229, but still it remains good. I said 200 was good. So obviously 229 is even better. And what's incredible is that his strikeout rate last year in the same level was 31.2%. And this year at that same level, 14.3%. He more than cut it in half and the walk rate from 8.2 to 12.4%. So just incredible kind of turnaround a 148 weighted runs created plus so he went from being about average offensively in the league to about 50 percent above average offensively in the league and he earned himself a promotion to double a with that performance so jimmy glowinky is in double a and he's a second baseman i don't know if he only plays second base but uh that's what it says on I'm not the number one authority on prospects. I can look at their numbers, but I don't watch. I've I've been getting better at this, but you know I know the name and I I certainly can look at the numbers, but uh, I don't I don't know. I can't tell you much about his fielding or whatever. But just a really impressive offensive turnaround from at the same level from one year to the next, and looks meaningful, not just like okay, well it's fluky looking. It looks like a meaningful improvement and earns that promotion to, to double a so that's where he is and in double a he joins marco luciano and i just want to uh get to him the next question is from gigantes who says what does a realistic timeline for luciano look like nowadays and for marco luciano just uh you know he's in double a they he didn't play at double a last year i think actually he was promoted at the very end of the season, I made and had some plate appearances in the postseason for Double A Richmond, but that doesn't really count, and it's not included in the stat line. I mean, it counts, but it's not included in the numbers. So he jumps from High A to Double A, and it was a struggle at first. And so overall, on the season, Luciano is in Double A, hitting just 185, 292 on base, 432 slugging. So again, a big gap between the average. And the slugging, 
and that's kind of more indicative of power than just simply looking at slugging alone. If you've got a 350 average and a 432 slugging, you're hitting for less power than if you have a 185 average and a 432 slugging. Uh, and so the power has been there. He's hit five home runs. I would imagine a bunch of doubles as well. Yeah, five doubles, five home runs out of 15 hits. So 10 of his 15 hits have been either a double or a homer, which you like to see. But he struggled mightily initially. And then in the past, I mean, I, I think starting with like May 17th. So I don't know, this is spanning... I don't know exactly how many games this is spanning and the little feature I'm trying to use is actually not working to show. Oh, there it is. So so since that time, since May 17th, it's like 12 games or so. He's hit 250 with a 352 on base and a 545 slugging. It's a 135 weighted runs created plus. So he's just he's improved and he hit a big home run last night. Let's see. In last night's game alone, we can uh, check on the performance uh he went two for four with a home run and a single no walks no strikeouts that's significant because the strikeout rate on the season there in double a 31.3 percent but it was like 38 percent earlier and so i think when i was looking at that those last 12 games or so i think the strikeout rate's like 12 percent uh excuse me like 25 percent which is much more manageable and the overall walk rate there in double a on the season i'm no longer looking at that 12 game sample i closed the tab but overall in the season there's 13 and a half percent walk rate which is very healthy so he's trending up in double a and in terms of realistic timeline just to mention that gabe kapler said there was a chance we could see him in the major leagues this year and so that's to me it's i don't want to call it like a total long shot but he would have to keep playing this way get the overall numbers looking really good in double A. And then as soon as you're in triple A, you're close. I mean, we've seen it with Bailey. We saw it with Schmidt. And so it's possible we see him at some point this year, September call up. I wouldn't, he's not going to get promoted today, but I think that if he keeps playing like this, keeps improving in double A, certainly it's, it's a possibility that we could see him this year, but otherwise definitely looking at next year, assuming he, he plays well and stays healthy, but you can never necessarily assume those things. But I'm hopeful because of the improvement he's shown in the last couple of weeks in double A at age, by the way, 21 years old. And so he's still young in terms of age appropriate levels. I believe he's he's very young for the double A level. So anyway, that is actually all, all the time we have for, for today. We'll have to save the Luis Matos talk for tomorrow, because like I said, Thanks again for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. And every day is tomorrow, more questions and answers. And I'm sure there will be some questions about Luis Matos, Casey Schmidt, Patrick Bailey, controversy. Is Joey Bart going to have a spot on the team given the performance of Bailey? So, so much to get into tomorrow. And just a reminder that the Giants play the Orioles tomorrow at 715 Pacific. And you can catch every pitch of the Giants hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app, search Giants. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot. So thank you in advance and thanks to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.